I'm Liz. I'm Health and Wellness Director at Compass UK in Ireland, and I'm here today with Ryan, who's Culinary Director for Urest. We're here today to talk about something that's very close to our heart, and that is the art and science of food. We've been exploring the psychology behind food and what we eat, and how it can make us happier, healthier, and more sustainable. There's three parts to our food philosophy. Food needs to be delicious, it needs to be mindful, and it has to be planet positive. So obviously I understand delicious, I love my food, but tell me a little bit about what, what does mindful mean? Mindful means that we have a nutrition first approach and we try and put a balance into every dish that we do. And planet positive? We care about where our food comes from. Um, we would try and use plant-based as often as we can and we try and look to use sustainable and British ingredients. As well as being planet positive, we know that people want to eat healthily and six out of 10 adults try to eat healthily. But here's the thing, over 65% of Brits are either obese or overweight. So actually, wanting it doesn't seem to be enough. One of the reasons behind this is that our subconscious drives much of our decision-making. So our quick responses or our auto decisions, they shape our behaviors without any real conscious consideration. So, how do we disrupt the system? How do we change those behaviour patterns and help people to make better decisions? These concerns are increasingly urgent in light of the recent COVID crisis. Research shows that obesity can be one of those underlying health issues which could have a more severe impact if you catch COVID. Sustainability is another key issue, and we all know that what we eat can have a negative impact on the planet. But I think it might be the case that sometimes people think that eating badly is the easier option. But it's so important to have a balanced diet and people do think that eating badly is the convenient, easier, cheaper option, but actually it isn't. Having a balanced diet is far better for you and actually more affordable given if you do it in the right way. Last year, we conducted some research with Amy Fetzer. She's head of research and analysis at Footprint and she was looking at what kind of interventions help people make healthier and sustainable choices when it comes to food. Amy's going to talk us through her findings. I'm Amy Fetzer, Head of Research and Analysis for Footprint Media Group. We are the go-to resource for sustainability within food service. Through our research, consultancy and forums and news, we really help the industry to tackle the key sustainability issues of the time, like sustainable diets, uh, food waste, water, energy and more. So I'm going to talk today about how we can use psychology and nudges to help people be healthier because the key point is that people really want to be healthy. We know uh, that even before COVID, two thirds of people wanted to reduce their salt, fat and sugar. But since COVID, uh, a lot of people said they have been eating more during lockdown and uh, about a third are keen to eat healthier. Uh, now things are easing. So it's really important that uh, food service plays our role because in normal times, we get one in six meals and a quarter of our calorie from food service. So this is a great responsibility and a privilege. We choose what people put in their mouths. We need to make that as healthy as possible. One of the key pieces that really came out in our research with the Compass customers is that they just wanted the default um, option to be healthier. So that everyday option, the lasagna, the fish and chips, the curries, the stock pots, they just wanted that to be as healthy as it possibly could be so they could enjoy their favorites uh, without worrying. So the ways to do this are obviously things like looking at the ingredients, reducing fat, sugar, salt, looking at upping the veg, that's a massive trend. Everybody wanted um, more vegetables, so making sure there is as vegetable packed as possible and also looking at things like sides. So making sure that the side options were also as healthy as possible and as appealing as possible. Other things that um, we found have been really helpful is looking at things like plate sizing and glass sizing. That really impacts on how much people take and how much people eat. So looking at these sort of non, um, these, these visual cues that sort of nudge you into eating more or less can be really helpful. Portion sizing is also really important here because no matter how healthy something is, if you eat way too much of it, it's still not going to be that good for you. So looking at portion sizing, making sure they're appropriate and also and also using uh, portioning tools can be really helpful within this. But also something that is often really helpful is looking at what 
range of porcelain sizes that can be offered, so perhaps including more half options or lighter, smaller sizes for lighter appetites. Um, so those can all really help to make the default healthier. Another key issue about helping people be healthier is using placement and promotion and the layout of the restaurant. So we know that primacy has a massive impact, especially in the cantina environment. The dishes that you see first on the boards and on the menus, but also when you walk up to the counter, people are much more likely to take those. So make sure that those healthier options are there first. Also with things like drinks and making sure that the, the low calorie or the water uh, is right at the front of the counter, you know, making things just ever so slightly harder to get really, really makes a difference in terms of how many people will take them. Also, when you're looking at the menus, uh, looking at the way that um, you describe things and the descriptors that are used are massively important in how much people uh, choose those dishes and want them. So even just your little um, signage in front of, a, in front of a dish, if you don't have a full menu, just to, to describe something from being a, you know, a, a beef stew to a, a Lancashire beef stew or a hearty beef stew or something, just a couple of descriptors can really change something from being uh, ordinary to being much more appealing. Another key concept that came out through the research was about using language that customers understand when you're talking about healthy items because there seemed to be a lot of confusion about what healthy means. People were a lot found it a lot easier to tell you what unhealthy meant. They could tell you what junk food was, what, what things that were high in fat, sugar and salts, but they found it much more difficult to categorize what healthy foods were. But they re did understand the concept of a balanced diet. They didn't necessarily use that term, but what they were describing was that they would talk about vegetables, fruits, meats, pulses. They understood a variety was important and a balance within that. So using this concept of a balanced diet can be really helpful for people. 70% of them said that fresh was very important as a quality uh, when it came to food. So again, highlighting those, um, those products that are fresh and that it's appropriate to use, but also there was, was not always a great understanding that things had been freshly prepared on site. So again, highlighting that in the messaging and the descriptions of the dishes so that people know that those curries, those lasagnas, those soups, those, those hot dishes are actually freshly prepared on site that day. So when we talk to customers about labels, what labels help them to identify healthier foods, the traffic light labelling system that's used uh, in retail had really good recognition. So that is something that food service can really adopt and use, especially in canteen environments, but in all sorts of environments to help highlight those dishes that are healthier and those that are, which are more indulgent that perhaps should be chosen less often. Another key issue which I was absolutely thrilled to uh, discover through the research was there was a really high understanding of the link between the environment and food. People understood that the food choices they made had a big impact on the environment. Uh, in fact, three out of four people understood this link. So this provides a massive opportunity. We know that sustainability and the climate crisis is very important to people. So this provides a massive opportunity to sell on sustainability, to use dishes which have better environmental credentials, uh, to, to really highlight those to customers and to help them uh, act on the climate crisis and to feel good about themselves and to make healthier choices in this way. when you're communicating with customers is to sell on well-being, not weight. And that's especially important given uh, the, the COVID situation that we're in and how weight has such an impact on, um, on outcomes. But the, the key here was that 98% of people said that they were motivated by well-being in, in wanting to eat more healthily. So this is how we can, again, if we can link food to these feelings of positivity, of well-being. People will care more about feeling good, having energy, being able to play with their children and, and good self-esteem. This is the kind of messaging that really resonates with people and will help them to choose healthier options and it will make it more appealing for them. final key finding that came out of the research was drinks. 
really important. Eight out of 10 people really think about health when they're choosing their drinks. So lots of people mentioned how they had switched to low calorie or no calorie options. And loads of people were talking about how they were focusing on drinking water. So it really indicates that the, the sugar campaign and the sugar tax has had a big impact on people's choices. So again, really using that to harness, uh, you're highlighting the healthier drink options, but you're also using that as a gateway to um, link perhaps meal deals with healthier drinks, with healthier products. Products, uh, to help people be healthier because it was something that resonated and seemed to be very important to customers. COVID-19 has shown us how important health is and we in food service have a really key role in helping people to be healthy. It's really important to look at all the ways that we can to make you know, the default, the healthiest option possible to help people make healthier choices without it being difficult or making them feel like they're losing out. To harness all the amazing ingredients and lovely fresh uh, colors and, and, and flavors and to really make it appealing and attractive and, and easy for people to eat healthily. If you want to find out some more about the research that I've been uh, talking about, the, you can read uh, both of the reports on Compass's website or on Footprint's website. They're called Getting Inside Customers' Minds and Design with Health in Mind. So they're talking about what customers think about health and also what psychology and nudges you can use. But please, it's such an important time for food port service. And if we can help people be healthier, it won't just help COVID, it will help everything and it will make people much happier and uh, contribute to a much brighter future. So. Go out there and change the world, please. As well as looking at sustainability, we're also looking at ways to reduce food waste, which is one of the biggest problems in our industry, but it's also a big problem at home. Absolutely. The UK wastes a massive 1.9 million tonnes of food each year. Whilst we can't reduce that figure overnight, we can work towards dramatically decreasing it. I think it's just the little things, isn't it? So since I've been working with Ryan, he's got me doing little bits like keeping broccoli stalks in Tupperware in my fridge. But I have to say, even though I, I work in it and I, I try really hard, I still can't get through a whole loaf of bread without throwing a couple of slices away. Great for croutons, great for bread and butter pudding. But at your rest, we are embedding a zero waste culture whilst we look at adding a circular food offer. A circular food offer means we don't throw anything away. So we're keeping all of the byproduct uh, that is normally perceived as waste. So our coriander stalks or the outer leaves of a, of a cabbage, the peelings of, of a carrot, all this can be used in different ways. We, we can pickle or we can use the coriander stalks in a, in a pesto. The cabbage goes great in a kimchi, for example. At your rest, we partner with organizations as part of our commitment to help reducing food waste. I caught up with leading charity Fair Share to find out more about how their Stop Food Waste campaign is making people take action. Hi Lindsay, thank you for having me down here at Fair Share HQ this morning. It's absolutely great to see where the food that we donate to you actually ends up and where it goes. Um, I first came across Fair Share when I was working uh, over in Ireland and I went up to Belfast and saw the amazing work that you did up there and I thought it was incredible. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you do? So the Belfast depot that you went to is very similar to the London one that we're in now and there are 24 across the whole of the United Kingdom. And we believe that no good food should go to waste. And so we work with principally the supply chain, so the, the growers, the logistics companies that sit behind the retail uh, or the hospitality uh, front line and take the vast, vast volumes of surpluses that are very, very small percentages and divert those to frontline charities using an amazing army of volunteers, many of whom are in this warehouse today. And in that way, we minimise the amount of food that goes, goes to waste. Food waste is a huge problem and it's really high on our agenda. And last year we donated uh, 35 tonnes yeah. of surplus food to Fair Share. However, in the first six months of 2020, due to the <coughs> pandemic, we've donated uh, five times that amount. So 172 and a half tonnes have come into Fair Share. And it's great to see that we've diverted that produce that's gone to really good causes. And that 172 tonnes is the equivalent of 410,000 meals. That, that's Wembley filled five times, if you're allowed to fill it. But also environmentally, 
you know, it is a well-proven fact that the, the most environmentally efficient way of disposing of food is between one of these and one of these. And, and, when, and when you think of the water, the nutrients, and the energy that goes into making food, by far the best thing to do is, is to consume it, to eat it. But there's a real relevance to now, because you know, we all know that in the next few months and the coming year, that the, the calibration of the supply and demand, that as hospitality reopens and hiccups and, and, uh, and, and the supply to be able to meet what, you know, what possible maximum demand might be, that's going to create surpluses. Now, clearly, nobody wants food to go to waste. And so the opportunity to be able to work with you to make sure that if there is a surplus, and we hope there isn't, um, but if there is a surplus, uh, and that there are errors between supply and demand, we know that there are very, very large numbers of people who are going to suffer the economic consequences of the, of the coronavirus over the next couple of years. Are we seeing a, a change in behaviour? We know that um, giving back is an important part of well-being, and I think in the recent months, a lot more, there's a lot more of a community feel. How have you seen that evolve uh, at Fair Share? Uh, right, you're absolutely right. Uh, so in the second week of March, when we, we made a, a big call out for more volunteers, we got more volunteers registering with us in one week across the whole of the UK than we did in the whole of 2019. It's incredible. And you know, you, we're surrounded by volunteers here who are doing an amazing, amazing job. We, you know, Fair Share just does not operate without the community. But alongside that, and I think this is a really important point I want to make, alongside that is actually we saw a change in behavior and belief from the food partners that we have. So initially we saw um, no food at all because of the, because of the shelves being stripped. Yeah. And then when the hospitality sector was closed down, suddenly the supply chain to the hospitality sector was offering us large, large volumes of food. And people were really passionate about, I've got this product, it's surplus. I know there are people out there in, who need it. You know, I'm aware of all of these food parcels are being put together for people who are vulnerable in lockdown, who can't get out of their houses. What can you do with it? Uh, and I have one memorable occasion where uh, a supplier of limes offered us 24 pallets of limes. That's a lot of limes. And we, we already had a lot. That's just in London alone. We wow. already had a lot of citrus fruit in the system, as you would expect. And um, so we said, look, we haven't really got the storage space for it. You know, and... Uh, you know, we know people aren't drinking gin and tonics at the moment. Not yet. Well, well, not, not in pubs and clubs anyway. And what was fantastic is this guy got angry because he was passionate, because he had good product and he didn't want it to go to waste. And that's where we're asking the food industry, don't lose that passion. Keep, keep that passion, please. Um, because in the whole of the rest of this year and next year, we're going to, our services are going to be needed like never before. And those small percentages, you know, 24 pallets of limes compared to what he was turning over was probably a drop in the ocean. But a drop in the ocean is big food parcels. And then the other point is the sustainability question. You know, customers want to know where their food comes from. They want to know the, uh, the provenance of it. They want to know the food miles. Uh, and, and also they want to know that no good food is going to waste. And I think that's been heightened during the pandemic. People really care more about where their food comes from. They want to know the provenance and traceability. I think that's really important. That's only going to benefit the food industry. Totally. But the, but the point that we're really making, and a big shout out to, um, to the food industry and the suppliers, particularly the hospitality sector, is guys, come and work with us. Because we can make your staff and your, and your colleagues uh, and your customers really feel proud to be working with you and, and being part of your business. Down here today, the place is buzzing. There's, there's people everywhere doing lots of things. So it shows that you know, we really are doing some good. Yeah, I mean, you can, you know, you can hear the forklift, you can hear, you hear the trolleys, food taking out. There are so, there's so many charities in London wanting food that we've got a, a, a whole series of private cars that are turning up from some of those charities. So I suppose slightly jump the queue from, from the deliveries that we do out. Um, there's another one turning up now. So, it's really buzzing, it's really busy. Uh, there's a lot of people who need this food. Yeah, so important. Absolutely. Uh, Lindsay, could you tell me a little bit more about the, the process? You know, how food comes in, where it goes, what sort of causes, good causes it goes to? So, I mean, at the height of the pandemic, we were supplying three and a half million meals every single week. 
but we have a supply chain that is the maddest in the world because we're using leftovers. So we don't really know what we're going to get from one day to another. You can see that looking around. It's yeah. an eclectic mix of, of food. You have a job on your hands to know what to do with it. Well, we can get anything that can be retailed um, because there will always be surpluses because of supply and demand. And so the key thing that we're, tr we're trying to do is, you know, yeah, we're focusing on what are the core staples that the charities that we want, uh, that we support want. And, and at the moment, across the whole of the UK, we're supporting in excess of 11,000 frontline charity and community groups who themselves are supplying a service to people who are vulnerable. Now, they are as broad and as, uh, and as eclectic as, I suppose, human frailty is. Uh, we've got domestic violence refuges um, that we support the length and breadth of the land. There are various projects that deal with uh, all of the forms of human addiction, gambling, drugs, alcohol. Um, mental health is a, is a prevalent issue across many, many of the, of the sectors that we support. And our own roots started in the homeless community. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just people who are turning to food banks. It's not just kids who are going to breakfast clubs at schools. It is as broad an range because that food is helping those frontline services save money. It's, it's making a massive difference. And I think what's really important as well, that they're getting a healthy, nutritious meal at the same time. So it's great to see lots of really good fruit and vegetables in, in the fridge. I think that's really, really important. I mean, what would you see as the, the main challenges that you face uh, running this operation? It, I think one of the biggest and largest challenges is, 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 that, is that flux between, of types of products. So for example, you know, in the big, big chiller behind me at the moment, uh, I lost count of the number of pallets of courgettes that we've got. We're in the middle of courgette season. And even if you just have, as I do, two plants at home, you get gluts. Lots. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and, and we've been working um, with you guys and others and trying to get recipes, pushing those out uh, and getting people to get and understand there's lots and lots of different things that you can do. Earlier in the year, same with asparagus. Yeah. And I think the end, the end user sometimes might not be the most experienced cook or Absolutely. chef in the kitchen. So I know what we've done in the past, um, remember at Christmas time, uh, you had an excess of carrots. So um, we looked at giving you lots of different recipes on carrots, not just carrot soup, boiled carrots, carrot mash. We looked at different things that you could do with the humble carrot, which went down really well. Yeah, and so until, and before you gave us that information, I'm, you know, I was a classic. I was thinking, well, I can cut them that way or I can cut them that way. Um, but, but, you know, the, 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 the lots of other different things you can do. And what's fantastic is what that does is drives and motivates all of those uh, 11,000 charities to all be food waste warriors as well, because they're in the front line of hunger of helping avoid food waste. Yeah. And I think as well, sometimes it's just that little bit of education. If we could give that little bit of guidance and support to help them do something a bit different or open their eyes up to another way of working, I think it could really make a difference. Early summer, we have huge, huge volumes of soft fruit, particularly strawberries. We've got all the courgettes now. We'll begin to get the cauliflowers and, and the cabbages coming in. So you know, as those crops grow and mature, uh, and there are those surpluses, we're having an amazing summer this year. Um, we're predicting that there is going to be even more surplus at the farm gate than there has ever been before. And as a, you want, it's important to work within the seasons. From a sustainability point of view, it shows that we're utilizing British produce as well, which is fantastic. So it's great to see that we have that excess fruit and vegetables as well that you're able to utilize. And, you know, and even though I was talking about the huge quantities of courgettes, people need to understand that more than 95% of the British produce that is surplus and could feed people still goes to waste. So we're not even touching the sides. We're a very ambitious organisation. We want to do a lot more. Well, what you do here at Fair Share is absolutely incredible. Um, I've really enjoyed coming down here today, seeing it in operation, seeing the buzz around the place. And I'm really proud of our partnership and I'm really looking forward to that growing. Well, and likewise, we love working with responsible businesses and, we, and we, we're very, very proud of our partnership with the Compass Group.
It's great to see some of the steps that we're making with food waste. And one of the other areas that we're looking at, especially in terms of environment, is plant-based. Plant-based is a massive trend and it's, it, it's holding up on its own way. It's not just for vegans. We're seeing more and more people looking at having a plant-based diet, not necessarily all the time, but that whole flexitarian lifestyle is something that we're looking to cater more and more for. What do you think, Ryan? Absolutely. Our Plant Delicious brand has gone down an absolute storm in our business. And we're incorporating more and more plant-based proteins into our dishes. Not only that, but looking at adding whole grains, nuts, fruits and seeds in as well. And I think there used to be a thing, I'm not sure if it still stands, but it used to be that people would think a meal wasn't a meal unless it had meat in it. What do you think about that? Absolutely. But perception is changing and it's not all about the meat anymore. Vegetables are very much the hero on the plate and there are lots of really good and sustainable plant-based alternatives out there. Our next speaker is Dr. Brian Cook, a senior researcher at Oxford University. Brian has extensively researched the health, social, environmental and economic impact of meat and dairy and how we can promote healthy and sustainable diets. He's here to tell us more about nudging techniques and his work as health behaviours lead for LEAP, that's Livestock, Environment and People. I'm Brian Cook. I'm a senior researcher in health behaviors at the Nuffield Department of Primary Care Health Sciences at the University of Oxford. And I'm working on the LEAP project here, which stands for Livestock, Environment and People. It's a four year long Welcome Trust funded project that's looking at the big pictures around how what we eat affects our health, society and planet. The particular angle that we're looking at specifically is looking at the consequences of meat production and consumption. What we know about the food we eat is that it certainly does have a big impact on the environment and the ruminants, especially beef and lamb, have a big impact on uh, global warming uh, and also in terms of uh, biodiversity loss and sometimes in terms of water uh, pollution as well. So the LEAP program brings together researchers from all different fields across the university to answer some of these important questions. A colleague at our uh, LEAP project here in Oxford, uh, Marco Springman, has done some research looking at um, how we need, what changes we need to make in society to keep within the so-called planetary limits of environmental sustainability. And when it comes to meat consumption, his calculations have said that in wealthier countries where we eat more meat, we would need to reduce the amount of beef we eat by about 89%. So there's a big need uh, for our shifts in our diet more towards plant-based eating. And we know that in general, plant-based uh, food choices are much better for the environment. So our work package is looking at how we can help people to make those decisions and what we can learn from behavioral sciences to nudge people towards those healthier and more sustainable food choices. So we look at things like default positioning of choices. So for example, if you have a vegetarian option at the top of menu, that's the default, default choice that people see. And that's been shown to increase, increase people's selection of that product in other things such as putting the meat-free products into the meat aisle in the supermarket, uh, a research that we've done has also been found that to be effective at increase, increasing people's selection of those. Uh, another strategy is availability, we call it. So increasing the ratio of meat-free to meat options within a category, such as shifting the number of hot meat meals within uh, your lunchtime menu uh, from three meat and one veggie to two meat, two veggie. That's been shown to be a rather subtle way of increasing people's purchasing of veggie options. Other things such as social norm messaging. So we know that people are very much influenced by what other people are doing. So sometimes people have used uh, messages within a uh, supermarket or restaurant environment to tell people that other people are trying to make a choice around adding more plant-based eating. Uh, we found that with this kind of research, at least preliminary results, we found that if you, uh, instead of saying that a lot of people are making this choice, if you focus on the process of change, so-called dynamic norms, where people are trying to make the shift over time, that may be more effective as a social norm message in this area. One other one I'll talk about is the equal labeling. So that's one where we're doing a lot of research ourselves right now. We know that when people go to make uh, food purchases, they have a general idea often these days that things like beef and lamb are not as good choices as plant-based options. But in general, we don't have a lot of information at the point of purchase about what actually is the best environmental choice. So it would be really good if people had that information at hand like they do right now on uh, many packaged products that tell you about the nutrient label and the nutrient content of food. 
So that's one where we're doing a lot of testing ourselves to see whether environmental impact values or eco-labels actually have an impact on what people buy. And what we've seen so far, at least in a virtual environment where we're able to test it, is that it does make a significant uh, impact on what people buy. If we look at the trends in meat consumption and plant-based eating in the UK, um, for example, are pe people eating less meat and eating more vegetarian options? Um, it's a surprisingly difficult question to answer. We've looked at the uh, government's uh, National Dietary and Nutrition Survey that tracks what people consume uh, every couple of years. And when we look at that analysis, we have seen a re reduction in meat consumption over the last decade, for example. Uh, we also see that uh, red meat especially has gone down more than others. And in fact, it's been an increase in poultry as people see red and processed meat as having some negative health outcomes. So they often switch to uh, white meat and poultry consumption. We also see that uh, the reduction in meat in the last decade has been a bit quicker for men than for women. Uh, we also look when, when we look at different um, uh, generations, we see that uh, most generations have actually also been decreasing the amount of meat that they eat. Yet curiously, the younger generation, who actually at baseline eat less meat than any others, have actually over the last decade been slightly increasing the amount of meat that they eat. Again, that might be consuming more poultry than red and processed meat. So we look at the impact of COVID as well. Uh, it's too early to say exactly whether the changes that we've seen in consumer purchasing are going to persist you know, a year from now. That's definitely something we want to look at. But we know when the panic buying that happened earlier this year, a lot of people were buying a lot more meat. People were going back to the classics, what they know, what they feel comfortable with. People are doing a lot more home cooking, and there hasn't been a lot more options to be able to eat outside the home. Uh, we know that if you look at the uh, meat consumption or meat purchases compared to last year, things like beef uh, and other things are, are still up compared to last year. So we don't know to what extent the uh, increases that we're seeing right now are overtaking the decreases that we've seen over the last decade. What we also know is when we look at the meat alternative products out there, the many different kinds of veggie sausages and veggie burgers, uh, those have been selling well, but we also have some insights that consumers may be seeing these as being a bit too unnatural and a bit too processed right now. So I think there's gonna be a shift in producers in looking at more whole food alternatives to these kinds of uh, meat products. And I think other companies that can position themselves to offer whole food alternatives uh, rather than more processed, these kind of meat mimic products may be better positioned to uh, serve customers in the future. So what's next for the LEAP project? So as I mentioned, we've got lots of researchers across the university looking at various aspects of the food system and how it impacts on health and the environment. For us, when it look, when in the area of consumer behavior, uh, the big part for us going forward will be to work, working with uh, a variety of partners to run some research trials in real consumer settings so we can actually have some good evidence of what works in the real world to nudge people towards these healthier, more sustainable food choices. So for us, it's a huge opportunity and a a huge benefit to be able to work with a great partner like Compass UK to be able to do some of this research and answer some of these uh, big questions going forward. The COVID crisis has made us all stop and reassess and think long and hard about what we want from life and work. It's clear that being part of something bigger, giving back, contributing to the community and having a positive impact on our planet are all motivators for us. And this can also apply to our food, where it comes from and how it's made. Hi, my name's Ollie. I work for Curb London's premier street food incubator and accelerator. We take very early stage businesses from an idea, give them training about how to, do, how to run their business, and then hopefully in the future, they'll get to open their own restaurant and run a sustainable business for 10 years. What I do at Curb is uh, I train those people. So I run, help run workshops, we do consultancy, and then we run this thing called the incubator scheme where we allow these people to basically learn on the job. So they trade and they learn how to run a business. Back in 2012, when Curb first launched, we were just running a lunchtime market at King's Cross 
we had about six traders. But some of those traders went on to be, well, they were at the time, Pizza Pilgrims, Bleaker Burger, Bao, huge businesses now. But they were kind of like the exception of quite a few traders who didn't have the same business skills as those three did. So what we realized um, a few years into the game was that actually we want to make education important as part of Curb. So when you join, you learn how to run a business. So we teach you about bookkeeping, we teach you about HR, we teach you about sourcing, all these things and like many more, like you got to run a business here. Um, so that's what we realized is a kind of our USP compared to other street food organizations. And that's why I think a lot of people want to work with us because they realize that we're supporting small businesses, not just giving them a place to trade, but actually supporting them to grow and become that next generation of bleaker bow pizza pilgrims that we talk about. We run workshops every quarter and we give people a genuinely like realistic idea of what it's going to be like to run a street food business. So we don't, we don't make it seem like it's a breeze. We give them the actual truth. One of our traders uh, opened his talk saying, hello everyone, I'm about to crush your dreams. But he also said that when you're at a market and the sun's shining and you're selling a portion of food that you've designed, made and cooked yourself to someone and someone's paid money for it and you've got a queue of people, there's nothing better in the world. So if you want to get into street food, be realistic that it's tough, but it can also be very rewarding. What people get wrong about street food is that it's not because it's being served from a gazebo or a truck that is the reason that people like it. It's because the quality is higher and the theater is there and you're actually getting it from the person who's making the food, who's designed that dish, runs the business, and so you're getting a much higher level of service. So because street food allows someone to start a business and start selling food and start selling a product without having too many overheads, there's a very low barrier to entry for the actual amount of money you need to start that business. So that's why we see a lot of the new trends coming through street food. Curb had London's first ever pokey business. So that's everywhere now, but we allowed uh, someone to start a pokey business because it was just easy to do. Whereas opening a restaurant running a chain of pokey restaurants is, is tough. For the future, I know everyone's keen to know what the next big trend is, but um, it's not gonna be as simple as like plant-based or fried chicken or a gourmet burger. I think there's an interesting thing where we know the difference between a Neapolitan pizza and a Roman pizza, but when it comes to places like India or China or even Africa as a continent, we can't distinguish between the different local cuisines. So my prediction is that when we come to Indian food, we'll talk about food from Mumbai or Goa or Kerala or Hyderabad. And when it comes to China, we'll talk about Hunanese, Xi'an, Cantonese, which is the Chinese food that we've all grown up eating. Um, so my prediction is that people are going to get more knowledgeable about their food, know where it comes from and know the differences that exist in these huge, huge countries when we can tell the difference between a BAP from the south of England to a BALM from uh, Newcastle. So how sustainable can you be as a street food business? The answer is uh, like pretty good, but not amazing because you're serving to the public in the outside and so you have to kind of on the whole use disposable packaging. But the amazing thing is that you are a very small business and you can have total control of your supply chain. You can go to the farm where you're buying the meat from. You can meet the cow that you're eventually gonna put in your burger. You can touch it and then mince it. Um, that is an amazing opportunity. And I think for a lot of people, having that control over every aspect of their business is brilliant. For example, Bleaker Burger, who sell hundreds and hundreds of burgers a day 
they know where their buns are made, like where the flour comes from, where the, all the potatoes come from, and where all the meat comes from. Other than that, you don't really need to know that much about, <laughs> about all the sourcing for a burger. Um, but it's amazing that they can have that much control over the supply chain and genuinely keep the quality that high. Back in 2008, when the financial crisis happened, some people looked to that as the sort of origin of this boom of street food. Um, I think we're going to see another one with coronavirus, actually. I think there's going to be a ton of people who might have been made redundant, say they were a really good chef working in a, in a chain that has now gone under. They might want to work for themselves and do their own business. You might see a ton of pizza businesses from Pizza Express closing. Um, and there's also a massive opportunity for our traders as well. Uh, these high streets where they've had all these chains that have been propped up by a lot of private equity, the rents uh, have to drop. And so that could, you could see a high street with a lot more independent businesses and a lot more variety. Coronavirus actually provides an opportunity for our traders as well. I th we, at the moment, charge 15% of uh, a trader's turnover to be at our market. But when they go to a restaurant, they might have to pay 100 grand a year with no reference to whatever they're turning over. So I think you'll also see a lot more businesses being on turnover rent. So it'll be 15% of their turnover rather than 100 grand. And that will allow for hopefully a lot more variety on the high street. Here at Urest, we're on a journey to shift our focus and increase our work with social enterprises so that we can supply our customers in a more purposeful way. Miss Macaroon is a social enterprise who make beautiful and delicious macaroons whilst helping young people gain valuable experience. Here's Rosie to tell you more. I'm Rosie Ginde and I'm the founder of Miss Macaroon. We're a community interest company and we make and sell French macaroons and we reinvest 100% of the profits in providing training and jobs for long-term unemployed young people. We work with ex-offenders, care leavers, young people with mental health issues and lone parents and people with learning difficulties and we help to build their skills and build their confidence and get them back into work. I chose to make macaroons because I was looking for the perfect product to create my social enterprise around. I knew I wanted a product that uh, kept me engaged after making thousands and thousands, but actually I wanted something that also had a part of it that was really simple so that young people who'd never walked into a kitchen before could actually make something quite beautiful. So French macaroons are incredible incredibly difficult to make and um, there's lots of different parts of the process that they can go wrong um, but they also have a very simple filling which can just be you know butter icing sugar and fresh lemon so a young person can just pick up these ingredients a very simple recipe and create something beautiful and I think that's part of the appeal of French macaroons that it's something that's quite difficult and quite complex and intricate, but also just very simplistic in how beautiful they are. Our customers are creating a better world by funding our Macaroons That Make a Difference training course. And that's a, a 10 week programme where we help long-term unemployed young people with mental health issues, learning difficulties, and a variety of other barriers get back into work. So we build their skills and their confidence and we work with a psychotherapist and counsellor, a personal safety expert, a recruitment agency, and a whole host of corporate partners to deliver welcome to work tours. Um, it's a really interesting programme that supports people to get into the workplace from you know, often households where nobody's worked for multiple generations um, gets them comfortable in a workplace and aspiring to work in really high-end establishments. And we give them work experience and help them to actually attend interviews and get jobs. And the most important part for us really is providing opportunities for mentors to give them one-to-one -one mentoring afterwards. And it's great to get some of our corporate partners involved in that as well, whether that is through providing the mentorship or sp sponsorship of the programmes. It's fantastic to see corporates and consumers alike really investing in our young people.
Personalization and customization are two huge trends that have come about over the past uh, couple of years really, um, but are really coming to the fore now. So at Miss Macaroon, we tap into that through our Pantone matching service, but also uh, we logo print. So we print uh, corporate um, logos and uh, brand messages, uh, event taglines onto the macaroons. And we also create bespoke packaging. So we print ribbons exactly to corporate colors with logos on, and we also create uh, branded gift tags. And this is really important when you're at an event and you want your um, clients or customers or potential customers to understand about your business, what you do and what makes you special. So it's a great place to talk about your values. And lots of corporates now um, are interested in sustainability and, you know, creating a a, a much better world. Uh, And social enterprises are, are you know, really well placed to help corporates to achieve those aims. And those branded gift tags are a great place to talk about that partnership, the impact um, created through, you know, just the sale of that one macaroon even, uh, and how it has changed the life of a young person. As our macaroons are only between 52 and 68 calories each, they are quite a low calorie treat. And, you know, when you have a coffee or or a tea and you don't want a huge muffin or a massive donut that is two or 300 calories, it's the perfect treat. You've got this real kind of pop of flavor um, that just kind of bursts in your mouth and, and it's a, a really indulgent treat. And I think that is part of its, its success. So people that you know might be watching their diets, um, then it, it, it does provide that little bit of indulgence as well. And I think it's, it's really nice as well for, for people who have a whole host of dietary requirements. Our macaroons are completely gluten-free um, and we're very, very strict about it. And we've got our new range of dairy-free uh, macaroons as well. So it's a great way to treat um, without having to necessarily think about what people's dietary requirements are. Um, And it's a great way just to kind of send out those little bits of indulgence all across the UK to friends and family. My predictions for the market are that indulgent treats will continue to grow. Although we're going into a time of uncertainty and potential recession, consumers will still want to purchase small, affordable treats maybe not the bigger items but definitely little bits of indulgence just to keep keep kind of life feeling a little bit normal and french macaroons are are definitely a great way because they're completely guilt-free in terms of the lower calorie great kind of quality products but also that we we reinvest 100% of our profits helping young people to get back into work and in terms of the larger corporates with the the dawn of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and this real focus on uh, it's everybody's responsibility to do as much as we can to make the world a better place social enterprises have this real opportunity to help corporates to achieve their goals and really you know push forward, whether that is, you know, getting young people into work or clean water projects or reducing food waste. You know, we have this great opportunity to to build a better world. Weight is an incredibly fraught issue for many of us. So whilst obesity might very much be in the news, it's best left away from the table. We recommend focusing on well-being instead. The great things about being healthy, the benefits of exercise, and the positive impact that can have on your mental health. As caterers, we talk about connecting people through food. We know that 70% of people with access to an on-site restaurant will eat with colleagues. And we also know that work friendships make people much more productive and happy at work. And especially in recent times, food has been helping us connect. Food has become a global obsession as we've all been trying new baking skills, experimenting with new cuisines and learning new skills as a family. The hot topic of the moment is food waste and what you can do with leftover foods. We showed you earlier some ingredients that were left over and we've actually turned these into some fantastic food waste hackers, which we're going to talk you through now. We've started to prepare two great hackers for you here. Um, using up those leftover ingredients, 
So we've done like a Korean um, style one. So we've taken kimchi where we've got leftover cauliflower leaves, carrot peelings, uh, the tops of spring onions, and made that into a really nice kimchi. A kimchi which is really good for your gut health as well, so really good for you. Now on top of that are broccoli stalks. So we've marinated them in a really nice Asian dressing and just charred those off. And then on top of that, uh, some pink pickled onions. So I'm just gonna finish off our Korean taco. I'm just gonna top it with some chilies. And we've actually pickled these chilies in leftover dill pickle juice. It was left over in the jar. So we've just added into there and it gives them a really nice flavor with a little bit of uh, dill pickle coming through as well. So I'm finish it with our aquafaba sriracha. Give it a nice kick. And then we'll just top with some sesame seeds and that one's good to go. So that's our first taco, Korean inspired. So our Mexican inspired taco, we've got some really nice and healthy black beans in there. We've added a bit of coffee grounds in there as well to give it a really earthy flavor. We've topped that with a pico de gallo. So that's like a Mexican salsa. We've diced up the tomatoes with some red onions, green chilies, a dash of lime and a little bit of garlic in there as well. Uh, and then we've got some pickled red cabbage and we've just used the root of the red cabbage, which is perfectly edible. And we've just dropped that into a really nice pickling liquor and just left that for a few days. So we're just gonna to top this one. We've also kept some cucumber skins, which we've pickled as well, which the cucumber skins are delicious. And we've just dropped that in the pickle for just for a couple of days. And then to finish, we're going to add some coriander stalks, which are absolutely packed full of flavor. And it's a shame to waste those. And to finish a bit of vibrant color, we're just gonna add some pomegranate seeds onto here as well. Ooh, okay, and that's our finished it. tacos. We'll just finish those tacos with a wedge of lime. Your diet choices influence your performance and work. Nutrition is part of building strong foundations for your health and well-being. It provides the energy to fuel concentration, decision-making ability and productivity, especially when managing decision-making processes or creativity for new ideas. Helena Rogers is co-founder of True Foods. She's passionate about gut health and she believes that consumers want to make informed choices about what they buy. She's made education, inspiration and entertainment central to her brand. Hi, I'm Helena Rogers, co-founder of True Foods. We're a functional food company that's all about gut healthy goodness. And by that, we mean gut healthy goodness. So it's good in terms of the food we make, but also in the way that we do business. So I started making granola for my family, like, like lots of startups. Um, I wanted a healthier option for, for my kids. Um, and it was tasted really good. Uh, my kids said, you know, my son said, you know what you should make, you should sell this, it's so good. Um, so I thought I'd give it a try. I started selling it on Facebook and sending it through the post to people and sending it to influencers and seeing what people thought. And it had quite a good uptake. And then so I thought maybe I should be a little bit more ambitious and, and, and go further. But we realized that we couldn't just sell any old granola. Our granola had to be special. So we started looking at the trends and, and discovered gut health. And we thought this could be something that really would be beneficial for people. And so in January 2018, we were the first company to launch uh, Gut Healthy Granola, also the first company to launch cereal in plastic free packaging. So really it's a combination of good for you and good for the planet. We're really passionate about gut health um, because it's fundamental to your physical and mental health and well-being. Last year, it was widely reported that one in five deaths, 22% of deaths in the UK was actually due to malnutrition. And that's not people don't have enough food, it's that people are eating all of the wrong food. And that really is quite shocking. Further to that, there was another study which said that 30% of deaths from diseases like strokes, heart attacks, um, and, and some forms of cancer could be prevented if only we were to eat 30 grams of fiber per day. Um, seems easy, doesn't it? Um, now, in the current reality, oh, people who are obese 
have got twice as likely, double the chance of being in critically ill with COVID-19. Um, so something has got to be done. And all of these things relate really to your gut health and your fiber consumption. Now, fiber consumption, you should eat 30 grams of fiber a day, but hardly anybody does. 94% of women and 87% of men don't eat that 30 grams of fiber. In fact, the average over the UK is closer to 18, 19 grams a day. We call this 12 gram difference between what people actually eat and what they should eat, the fiber gap. And that's what we're really here to fill. We see our mission as true to be to help fill that fiber gap so that people live longer, healthier and happier lives. Breakfast is a really good time to kickstart your fibre consumption for the day. Most breakfast cereals contain between one and five grams of fibre per bowl. All of true breakfast cereals contain almost double that. So our granola is nine grams of fibre per bowl, our porridge is eight grams of fibre. And that's a really good way of kickstarting and getting that bit of extra fibre boost. If you were to add a sliced apple with that, a few strawberries and some raspberries, you'll get up to say 12 grams. Finish your breakfast off with a slice of wholemeal toast with some peanut butter. You get to 16 grams. That's more than halfway to your magic 30 grams that will really bring the positive health benefits. So that's kind of what we would really, really recommend. Now, our breakfast cereals, our true breakfast cereals, also contain six grams of prebiotic fiber per bowl. You want to try and to get to be really gut healthy, you want to try and eat 12 grams of prebiotic fiber per day. Um, and this is the fiber that helps feed all of those good gut bacteria that bring lots and lots of positive physical and mental health benefits. It's really important to realize that gut health isn't just about the food that you're eating, it's also about your lifestyle. So we say that there's four pillars to gut health. Number one is the food that you eat and it is your diet. You need to eat loads of whole food, loads of grains and loads of vegetables. They really are the key to a healthy life. Number two is exercise. You need to incorporate exercise into your daily routine. I am really passionate about this because after doing the 0 to 5 k app a couple of years ago, it truly changed my life. I now I feel much braver. I feel much stronger at 51 than I have for many years. I even play rugby for Folkestone women's rugby team. So, you know, if I can do that, anybody can. So exercise, number two, really important. Number three is sleep you need to sleep and you need to plan your sleep and make sure you've got the conditions to allow you to get those six to eight hours every night. So really think about that because that's when your body repairs itself. The fourth pillar is managing your stress. Stresses in life are inevitable, but how you manage it makes the difference. So whether that's through mindfulness, through meditation, there are all different ways that you can help manage your stress, but you do have to because it'll impact on the rest of the areas. Our website, eattrue.com, contains loads of hints and tips that will really help you manage those four pillars to ensure you have a gut healthy lifestyle. Britain's Healthiest Workplace study last year showed that on average, 38 days are lost per worker due to sickness and illness. That costs our economy over 90 billion pounds and three quarters of that could be prevented if people made better health choices. That's something we've got to do something about. At True, we see the workplace as the perfect place to both educate and inspire people to make better choices. Now, you've got to be careful how you do this. People don't want to be preached to or patronised, so you've got to get the tone of voice right. But not only that, you have to get the food products right, because people are not prepared to compromise either on convenience or on taste. So it has to deliver on all levels. If we can get this right, we can make fundamental changes to people's lives. And that for me is really motivating. We've had a fabulous lineup of speakers today. And we work with some great partners and working with these partners allows us to continually make our food even more delicious, nutritious and healthy. Here at Urest, our goal is to develop dishes that benefit not just your health, but your community and the environment too. All put together in a way that looks and tastes delicious. 
Thanks to our speakers for being part of today's event and thanks to you for joining us. Our next event is on the 8th of October and it's all about the art and science of coffee. See you then.